Hello, Robin. Hello, nice to meet you. Oh, I just have to say, I have been um, I'm enjoying your book so much. I've listened to them actually twice now on uh, audiobook with your beautiful voice, oh. <laughs> reading them. <laughs> uh, thank you very oh. much. Oh, I'm glad you listened. You know, it it was really fun to record them. They'd said, oh, well, we'll get a really good narrator for your books. And I thought, I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Who else could pronounce both Potawatomi words and botanical Latin, you know? <laughs> exactly. Hello and welcome to Artists on Writers, Writers on Artists, a co-production of Art Forum and Book Forum magazines. Each month, this series brings together luminaries in the fields of art and literature for free-form, intimate conversations about the subjects that they wish to talk about. I'm Jennifer Krasinski, the magazine's digital editorial director, and I'd like to welcome you to today's conversation between musician artist Bjork and author scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer. During their talk, Bjork and Robin graze many wonderful subjects. They talk about how language connects or disconnects us from the natural world. They relate some of the consequences, both personal and global, of living apart from nature. They also share what it means in this, our transient society, to feel at home and in right relationship to the land. When Bjork first introduced herself to all of us on the call, she described herself as, and I quote, a nature nerd from Iceland. But that's, of course, not all she is. She is a singer whose voice is unlike any other, and a songwriter whose music has traversed so many genres that her music has essentially become a genre unto itself. Her most recent record, Fosora, is her 10th, and has been receiving wide acclaim since its release this past September. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, as well as Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses. She is a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, whose mission is to create programs which draw on the wisdom of both Indigenous and scientific knowledge for the shared goals of sustainability. And just a few days before Robin and Bjork spoke, Robin was named a 2022 MacArthur Fellow. Before their conversation begins, both Art Forum and Book Forum wish to thank our sponsor for this episode, the New York Historical Society, where visitors can experience untold American stories through groundbreaking exhibitions, outstanding collections, immersive films, and thought-provoking conversations. Visit nyhistory.org for more information. And now, please enjoy the conversation between Bjork and Robin Wall Kimmerer. I was wondering if it would be a good icebreaker just if I would just sort of start asking you the questions that I, 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 I don't know, I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago. Uh -huh. Does that sound like a good beginning? Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, and I think we're uh, probably cut from the same cloth. It's I, <laughs> in terms of, you know, being, um, I anyway, I'm a, I'm a committed introvert. <laughs> so this will be nice just to have an intimate conversation to begin. Yes, and we're probably both more used to being interviewed than being the interview we. So, yeah. So I wanted to first just, um, point out that we have probably a similar cusp uh, of the academic versus uh, nature or folklore, even though we are obviously very, very, very different, me and you. I studied music for 10 years, and then around 2010, when touch screen happened, I tried to make uh, musicology for children that was more connected to natural structures. But at the same time, I've always written all my melodies, hiking outside uh, and purposely unaware of which notes I'm singing. Uh, this seems to align well with your wonderful tale of the three sisters, how your tribe had their pockets full of seeds 
and then they spread organically over the hills. Uh, and that wonderful story when you say that Columbus and those guys came and just because agriculture wasn't in straight lines, they didn't think it was agriculture. Um, and then also, I'm curious, uh, also in your book on the same topic, you mentioned how science has a habit of dissing female botanists. Um, and yeah, I, I understand the cusp of this binary very well. And I feel both of us have made it into our life's work to sew it together. Beautifully said. Yeah. You know, in, in ecological sciences, we call that meeting place between communities, like between a forest and a meadow, or a meadow and a wetland, you know, an ecotone. It's this place where two different worlds meet. And, you know, as a botanist, I love those places because they're so diverse. They have elements of each, but they also have things that only live there. They're full of birds, they're full of fruit. You know, it's so productive at the edges. And so those edges, as you say, between the, the natural world and the built environment, between uh, matter and spirit, um, I find to be really productive. And for a long time, maybe you felt this way too, I'd, I'd love to know, um, that inhabiting those marginal areas can make you feel like you don't belong either place, but then you realize you belong right there. You belong there, as you said, trying to stitch them together. And that's certainly the reality for me in working at the intersection of, of indigenous knowledge and, and Western scientific knowledge as well. Yeah, I think that's that's so interesting and you mentioned that so many times in your books it's very very inspiring and yeah in Iceland we're still very connected to nature I think and we didn't I think we're like total animists <laughs> we're told stories about how every lava rock and cliff is a troll that got hardened in the sun like they are nocturnal and cannot stand the daylight as they become mountains if they haven't entered their caves by sunrise. This uh, reason resonated very hard for me when you talked about how in your original language you treat nouns differently than the English. Like for example, when you say to be a bay, that you are a bay, when you you know or to be a Saturday instead of just bay or Saturday it seems like there is again a very seamless connection there yes um and I love the way that language reminds us of that animacy of the of the living world that those rocks that you speak of are are living beings, you know, with their own stories, their their own history, their own gifts in the world. Um, and that's something that is so precious to me about the, the Potawatomi language is, is that, you know, that everything's a verb. It isn't, it isn't just, you know, a state of matter. It's, it has agency, right? You know, it, it could create itself again. It could be something else and and it pains me the way that that English is so um bound to sort of the objective nature of of the world is this as if the world was just stuff instead of um you know this whole gorgeous community of, of living beings could I ask you in Icelandic languages are is there this this animacy built into your language as well um, well, Icelandic has is like German origin. It, it is basically like, I think technically it's called Old Norse. So it hasn't changed for a thousand years. Uh, I think we, I think we unfortunately share the verb problem with the English. Um, 
Uh, but I think one thing that we do have is is most of our names, like like human names and and mountains and uh, everything around us. We still understand. It's still the language we we understand. So so it hasn't changed. Like we can still read books uh, that were written thousand years ago, and and uh, like you know my name is Birch and. My brother's name is straight translation Eagle, and my mother's straight translation of her name is is uh, Rune. You know, like a secret Rune. Yes. And 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 so on. So it is, um, and also the mountains around us. They they all are called names, and and they are uh, that we understand. And actually. It, um, we don't really have like monuments like in you know Rome or pyramids like in Egypt, but we do have like um, each mountain has like a story. Why it, you know, and often there will be some creation story, you know, of of trolls and or or combat or 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 like a troll that was late uh, into his cave or. So, you know, this it is in that sense, it is very connected, yeah, with nature still. Nice, nice. And I love that when places and the names of places especially evoke those stories that they hold. Um, and then wow, you walk through the world in such a different way because when you see that mountain or 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 that river, you're reminded of the story of, of, of that place, of the beings who are around you. Um, so much better than when we, you know, name mountains or places after, after colonizers, right? Just somebody's, somebody's name, Smithtown. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> um, so I, I love that that naming tradition is, is very much alive for you. I was, I, I hope I'm not too selfish. If I go back into your book, I'm, I'm like a very greedy student. <laughs> but um, I just really also enjoy the part, there's a chapter about the environment, which of course we could talk about for a, a year. But I, my favorite part is when you talk about species loneliness yeah. and and also, indigenous immigrants and and also you ask the question can immigrants become indigenous and if so can they reach state of reciproc reciprocity <laughs> I can never say the word uh, I just find that such a, a, a beautiful uh, concept like in a sort of biological way like species loneliness is that a term yeah, it's a term that I, I wish I had at my fingertips who originated that term, but I think it came from the um, studies of eco-psychology um, and the idea of species loneliness that, that we have forgotten or more truthfully been made to forget, um, that animacy of the living world. It, it's part of that idea of of human exceptionalism, right? That human beings are the only ones who matter, um, that we're at the top of some kind of fictional pyramid of, of life and all the rest are, are below us. Um, you know, that old expression of it's lonely at the top. And when you create this fictional pyramid of dominion over the world with human beings alone at the top, we, do, we don't have the companionship or the counsel of um or just the fun and the wonder of 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 other species in our lives and you know in so many places where where people are surrounded by the built environment all they interact with is made by humans and and so i think it makes us lonely for our for our kinfolk um the birds and the plants and 
and it has real consequences. Did you see that study as a musician? I wonder whether this really connects with you. There was a study not long ago, which um, so-called proved that human beings' happiness are related to the amount of birdsong in their lives. That people who are surrounded by birdsong are much happier than people who aren't. Um, it made me laugh that somebody had to do a study <laughs> to, to demonstrate what we all would intuitively know. Um, but I think that's an example of, of the outcomes of species loneliness when we don't have the beauty and the sound and the relationships with other beings around us. It, it leads to the same kind of loneliness that we might feel when we're estranged from our human family, for me anyway. Is it only, you are, if I remember it right, you were also talking about, you took an example of, I thought it was quite beautiful when, when all, the, all the interesting things you just said about how the humans ended up being a lonely species, but you sort of, it came from, like you were comparing it to plants and and kind of when they that it's not a good sign uh, i can't remember which plants you mentioned um that that that, there, that is you know that they need to to be more in um in uh, harmony with with other other plants to survive well yeah you you make a an excellent point of course because none of us survive alone. We're all in this web of interactions, right? I think you couldn't choose any plant. I don't remember exactly which ones um, you're talking about, but it doesn't matter because it would be true for every plant who needs its pollinators, who needs its dispersers, who needs the fungi in the soil that are feeding them and, and connecting them. This, this whole idea that, that any one of us is an individual it's <laughs> simply biologically not true. Um, we, are, we, are, we are connected so physically to other beings and, and yet we sort of psychologically, socially, ecologically, we deny that. We, we, we like to think that we're somehow separate from nature and it's, it's not biologically true and, and I don't find it spiritually true either yes uh, how how is it with the um i'm also the indigenous immigrants i i just got i just found that so interesting because i just sort of selfishly had a little struggle uh, when I, my second home for a long time was in a city in in usa and uh, and this kind of um, how if an immigrant can become indigenous uh, if he reaches a state of uh, reciprocity. Um, I just thought, um, so philosophically, that was just, uh, yeah, so interesting. I, I, I think I always find it quite tricky to survive in cities. I, I, I actually noticed <laughs> after being for three years in the pandemic in Iceland, and I'm now like in London and I can I can take about a week, but then I'm I start like walking everywhere like for five hours just to my appointments, just to get like the sense of sort of just to feel slightly normal. Um uh, and you also talked in your um book about you know how you when you do gardening, you you get like uh, oxytocin from just from you know touching the the earth and the soil. Uh, I'm just sort of curious about surviving in cities, maybe, and and uh, your how you how you have dealt with that. And and I sometimes, even though like I walk for five hours uh, or something, like the you know when you walk in nature, you get sorry, this is gonna sound very happy. You get like re-energized. You get like a bus up your legs but but in cities it's uh like there's no current going up your legs and i get like wobbly legs and sort of um t like tired um th th does this make any sense 
Oh, it, it so makes sense to me. Um, yeah. I, yes, exactly. Um, everything you said, I, I, I agree. I, you know, and good for you to be able to stand a whole week. You know, sometimes I feel crazy after like one day in the city. And, you know, I think, and I, I wonder if this is true for you too. It has to do for me with this, um, you know, when you're on the land, when you're in the forest, you're, for me anyway, I'm so open and paying attention to everything going around, on around me, you know, the who's blooming, the, what the wind is doing, who's singing, what insects are out, that I have this quality of attention that is so open. And then when I go to the city, I can't shut it off. And so all of the noise and the sort of jingle jangle of a of a city just overwhelms me um but i want to return to your question and it's related of of how do immigrant people become indigenous to place um because i think that is at the heart of some of the crises that we are all facing socially is that we don't have a sense of belonging to a place. Um, and there was, a, as I talk about in the book, there was a wonderful um, teacher for me, Henry Lickers, who is a, a Mohawk teacher. And, and he said that his father always said that the, the real problems that flow from, from um, let, let's say broadly speaking, um, immigrant culture here in, in North America is that the immigrants still have their feet on the ship, that they haven't committed to living in this new land. They have kind of a frontier mentality of, well, we're just going to come and take what we want and move on because it's not really our home. And that only when you start to feel at home, to feel like you're gonna live there forever, like your descendants are going to live there, then you really start taking care of that place and letting it take care of you. Um, and so his teachings were all about how, how do we come to be at home? Because when we feel deeply at home, you're not gonna wreck your home. Um, you wreck places that, that where you're transient. Um, and so, in fact, a lot of the stories in Braiding Sweetgrass grow out of this exploration of what is it to be at home? How can we, in our very transient contemporary society, how do we come to be at home and therefore in, in right relationship with, with land? And reciprocity seems to me to be part of that equation, just as we can say, well, this land is taking care of me. You know, it's, it's giving me water, it's giving me food, it's giving me air. Um, what could I give back? And I think we just know this intuitively, right? When we when we feel like we're strangers in a place, we, you know, we we get involved. We 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 give back to the community that we're that we're entering and therefore feel at home. So we should, I think, have an opportunity to give back to the land as well, to say, how, how could I be in balance with the land, not just to take her, but what could I give back to the land? And in that give and take, you start to feel at home. And to me, that's how immigrants become I, I don't want to say indigenous, but indigenous to place, or really for me, the better language is borrowing from, from botany. And that is the way in which plants from other places that come to um, a, a new landscape, eventually we call them naturalized. They're not native to this place, but they've integrated themselves into this place. They've become part of the community, part of the ecosystem. So it's really an invitation to become naturalized to place, to live, to live in a place as if it mattered. Um, I guess is really, is really what I'm saying. Sorry, that was a really 
long and rambly um, oh, way to say that. It's beautiful. And I'm so happy you 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 mentioned reciprocity. I can still not say it. Reciprocity. I think it's, I, I, I almost when I read your book, I wanted to count how many times you write it and make like a rhythm out of it because it's like a, it's like a rap that, that goes through all your book. Yes. I think it's like your theme, theme word. Um, and it's so inspiring how you write, you know, about the gratefulness of indigenous people, uh, you know, how they feel for plants and the complicated reciprocity, both unconditionally and not. Um, I was just thinking about how that could sort of mirror like my work, not on a superficial way, but more sort of deep, uh, deeper. And I, I feel like in collaboration in music, this is very important. You can hear it in the song if the musicians are merging or not. And sometimes you meet people and in that friction, you gain almost like clairvoyant knowledge on what the other person needs to learn in order to transform in a truly meaningful, creative way and when that the few times when that happens uh in that moment they it's like a mirror they know that same thing about you and they get the same sort of information and then a miraculous transformation happens but it only works if it's a reciprocal <laughs> equal equal yeah and even somehow. And uh, yeah, you talk so much about how you have to be careful about what you take from nature and you have to be aware of that it is a fertile exchange and that after the event, um, try to be like aware of this with my fellow musicians. Uh, it's important to leave uh, some good Collab collaboration karma like out there does that make sense Bjork I love that yes I can I've not experienced it but in the way you describe it it feels very true and, and just in that that kind of spirit of of this mutual exchange so that that both are better for the collaboration and yeah, I think that's what that what I'm trying to inspire with the living world, as you do in your music, um, to say how, what what happens when we when we create, as you said beautifully, that that mirror between between creators that that allow both to learn. That's that's amazing, um, and. Listening to you talk about that, it strikes me that these ideas about reciprocity and, and mutual flourishing are, you know, it's just common sense when we, we know, we feel intuitively when, when that's working, when there's a balance, when there's the energy exchange. And we know how to do it, um, but we have to somehow encourage ourselves to do it, give each other permission maybe um, to have that kind of reciprocity with each other and, and, and with the land as well. You know, I, I worry that our Western culture of hyper individualism cuts us off from that kind of magic of, of, of reciprocity that you're describing. And I should also say you're totally right about braiding sweetgrass, that 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 repeated mantra, every single story is meant to be an example of, of, of reciprocity in, in so many different realms, in hopes that readers will say, as you have, how how could I be in in reciprocity with with all the things that have been given to me? What what could I give back? Do you feel like um because um that the academia is changing. I'm just feeling with environment. And uh, I actually just was lucky enough to do a beautiful interview with Greta Thunberg, 
two weeks ago yeah about a book which you are also in amongst other 100 specialists um and i'm kind of wanting so bad like everyone to be be hopeful um i was just thinking about uh you know you talk about the lens of of science because there is a sacred lens uh, in mythology uh, but but is the lens um, of science sacred enough and do you think do you feel it's changing you know even just in the time since you wrote your book like that that the world is is moving a little bit I do I do it feels to me like we're in a really trans potentially transformative moment where it's as if we're remembering how to be whole um, because in the the strictly objective materialist lens of western science that is not just you know it's not just science it's a whole worldview right of of materialism and 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 thinking about objects divorced from 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 spirit and subject um it does feel to me like people are saying oh, wait why do we have to use only one of these lenses wouldn't we know better wouldn't we understand better wouldn't we relate to one another better if we used all of our ways of knowing, not only the intellect and, and uh, sort of rational science, but if we also engaged our emotional intelligence, our spiritual ways of knowing, if we engaged the intelligences of the natural world in addition to our own, um, we would just be so much more whole and rich and, and uh, able to um, conceive differently of the world. And I do think it's happening. It's, in my experience in the university, it's being driven primarily by students. Um, the, you know, in, in, in any institution, I suppose, the, the, the folks who are the, uh, the organizers, the, 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 the ones who sort of hold the power and set the framework, they often tend to rely on the framework that they learned when they were young students. Um, and that creates some inertia, right? So things don't change very fast. But it feels to me like, like um, students are really pushing for this wholeness, for, for thinking about environment, not just in a biophysical way, but in a biocultural way as well. And it, it's, it's, it has, you know, tremendous power to transform i think it's it's a it's a very exciting moment yeah i i was reading so many interesting articles there i didn't know that and also obviously i want to change you know work locally uh, and it seems like in iceland uh, we could really uh, farm uh, seaweed in the oceans around us that that could be done in a sort of on a humongous scale that could actually affect the acidity of the oceans. So, I I I found a lot of sort of hopeful things in that that book. That you know, uh, it's I I'm yeah. I think there was it's a very very well. Um, I also like how that book has like so many chapters. So you you can just go directly to whatever it is that you're interested in. So it's a very easy to sort of use, you know. Uh -huh. So, yes. So congratulations with that book. You know, I think it's going to make a big impact. And what one of the things I, ha I haven't seen it all whole yet, but one of the things that I like and what I have seen is just what you're talking about is that it's really diverse. You know, there are engineering approaches, economic approaches, cultural approaches, artistic approaches. Um, and, and so I think it, it, I hope it will be inspiring to people to say, well, there's so many avenues into this urgent work of, of climate justice. I just finished a whole album that took me five years and it's all mushroom inspired and I wrote arrangement for six bass clarinets 
that are I'm trying to make them move like uh, mycelium in the ground. So I you cannot describe the happiness of when I heard you talk about that there's a certain word in your language. I'm probably going to fuck it up now. <laughs> it is the life force of a mushroom. And it's called popo we. Yes. So so just just not the mushroom itself, but just the force that thrashes a mushroom through the soil up to the ground. That that, that just that that energy has its own word. You have to tell me a little bit more about this, Robin, please. It I uh, that word is so illuminating, isn't it? That it's like this whole like way of seeing the world that you not only name things but that you name these forces these life forces as well um and yeah um, that is exactly what it means the force that causes mushrooms to push up from the ground overnight and I, I was so in love with that word I began you know asking language teachers well are there words for other forces and there are there's for like the unfolding of flowers has its own word which i can't remember at the moment um and of seeds uh germinating and bursting out of their their seed coats there's a word for that as well um yes. and <laughs> i just love it and and to me that is such a biologically physically it's fascinating to think of how that happens but it also feels like a very sacred energy of 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 a life force and and i've been you know really thinking about in english what's the equivalent um do we even have a, a word for this this life force in 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 english and uh i happened upon um, or actually someone shared with me and when I asked this question of what are the words that we have for that and apparently in from Latin there is a word viriditas of of the force that causes the greening of the world um, wow. I'm write that and, uh, yeah I I'm in love with that word too because it feels like it's in harmony with yeah with Papoi and um it actually I think was coined um by the 14th century um uh thinker and religious figure uh Hildegard of Bingen oh. Hildegard von Bingen I think mm -hmm. that she, that word is attributed to her as this sacred force of of life that not only is present in the living world, but is, is present in us too, as this kind of healing, life emerging kind of force. Um, what a thing to celebrate and to, and to try to, to, to understand what is this life force? I, I would, I sort of kind of might have to mention one more thing, but the last song on my album uh, is actually, partly inspired by the beautiful chapter in your book when you are saying goodbye to your daughter and you to school and you go canoeing on the water lily pond yes and then you get stuck in the water lilies and then you see all the generations uh, through the clarity of the water down into the pond yes and uh and i'm i have a daughter who's 20 and she went off to school and the last uh, song on my album uh i'd like to thank you for the inspiration robin uh, it's called her mother's house and i wrote it to her um you know how i sometimes am super clumsy and saying goodbye to her in Kini, and then uh, next day i'm super graceful and over the top you know amazing and then the next day i'm clumsy again um, and I was sort of wrote the song as sort of a joke on myself and and then I played it for her and she actually ended up uh, singing it with me and writing her own verse um, and uh, singing it with me. So wow. I'm quite um, happy about that. And I are, are your daughters, are they getting into, are they, do they like plants? <laughs> they do they do 
And and thank you, Bjork, for sharing that story. Are we going to be, is that album out yet or will we be able to hear it soon? I can't wait. Yeah, it's like, I, I mean, just a week ago or something. But yeah, oh, it just came awesome. out. Mm -hmm. I will be finding that. Um, yes, um, both of my daughters are are lovers of plants in, in, in different ways. They both have, they both have gardens um, and they both, you know, walk through the world with a, with an eye for the beauty of the botanical world. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And I see them, I'm lucky enough now to be a grandmother and I see it in the grandkids too, who, you know, my 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 little grandkids who go through the yard and say, "Oh, there's the band aid plant. Oh, there's the bee plant." <laughs> um, so um, I'm I'm so grateful that they too can have this joy of of connecting with 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 the plant world. Um, yeah, I am so glad that chapter about saying goodbye to our daughters as they go into this next phase of life was was connected for you um you know what I almost didn't put it in the book I thought oh I don't know that's that's so deeply personal I'm probably the only one who has who has thought about this in this way and I so many mothers and fathers too um who have said oh thank you <laughs> thank you i knew i wasn't alone in that that moment of transition right um it's it's really hard and really beautiful too yes and also because you you tr you turn in the chapter and it becomes so beautiful and optimistic with uh and that you how you describe that that image of the clarity of the pond and how you see all the generations of water lilies is it's it makes you really sort of zoom out and understand so beautifully that it's you know not just about you you need to like let go but mm -hmm. i i also think it's it's uh weirdly feminist that you kept that chapter in uh i i, I after that i actually started looking around and I think there are so many books and so many uh, films and about fathers saying goodbye to their sons and you know you know Star Wars you know you know uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not gonna name like hundred films and books um, but I I think this particular uh, uh, subject matter I don't think there's no, I mean correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think there's not that much of it out there to be honest. That's a really interesting perspective. I think you're probably right. Like like you had, I don't know, but yeah. 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 Could I ask? I love that that you and your daughter sang that song together. Um, is she a musician too? Yes, she both uh she she know at that age where she's uh trying out a lot of things, which is amazing, which you should do. Uh, both music and acting and and uh, directing and um, yeah all, all kind of kind of things I, so uh, yeah sorry I don't want to say too much because you you know you, you don't want to jinx it but um, <laughs> yeah for her sake for her sake but yes yeah, she she does uh, she she she's sort of in a spot now that she could go many directions so. Yeah, we'll Good see. For Good for her. Could I ask? Could I ask you a question that yes, has been absolutely. much? And and then then I'll let you go. And, and absolutely. Um, I'm I'm was so interested in when we began talking that you were talking about as you go hiking or just out on the land that you you sort of hear the music of the place and then to hear about your your new music that is inspired by mushrooms i would just could you say more about how the natural world um kind of connects with you in terms of sound and music 
Um, yes, I think as I get older and as I meet more musicians, I kind of understand um, learning that maybe this is not as common as I thought. I'm not even sure. I think it could be an Icelandic thing, but um, I have a feeling maybe in a lot of rural areas, um, you know, when people walk from, you know, the next village or, or go for a walk in the forest. I think people, even though they don't talk about it, they probably start like humming a song. I think it's a very sort of um, natural thing to do. Uh, and you sort of try to make sense of, you know, your day and what happened to you. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, that we have the song lines in, in, in with Aboriginals in Australia, which is of course sort of epic, but I didn't even find out about that till I was a grown up. So, but I, I, oh, this was, I used, I had, there was like 40 minute walk to school uh, where, uh, and I started, we moved to this new place and I was like probably around six or eight, no, eight, let's be, yeah, eight, between eight and 12 was the period where I, there was like 40 minute walk to my school. And I think, uh, it was just my way of sort of, I, I loved it because I was quite an introvert. So I would just sort of walk and usually you walk, you know, for a while and then suddenly you like, um, you start humming and then you kind of, something comes out and usually the bit, bit that comes first out is the bit that you don't understand with like the human behavior or like illogical stuff. Um, and then you walk and you keep walking and then you roll it around in circles. And then usually, I think it's a human nature, you come with some sort of a conclusion. <laughs> and that kind of ends up being the chorus, I guess. Um, uh, I, th I actually think this is really common. I think it's a really sort of natural thing uh, for, for, for all of us to do. And, and I think there's a reason why there is such a thing as a verse which is the riddle and then chorus sort of where you where you solve it but maybe I, if I could answer your question like from another point of view which is more abstract or sort of spatial mm -hmm. which I definitely did experience um uh now that I've been I was just loving so much to be two two three years in Iceland and not I haven't been so much at home since I was 16 and I, I, every cell in my body was just loving it and 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 it was actually interesting to come back here uh, traveling and just I think it's a I think like when you see those kind of nature films with David Attenborough or whatever and you see all the birds of paradise like sing and they're all like territorial or or the birds that you were <laughs> talking about earlier uh, that make makes people happy mm -hmm. of course oh, the, the need to sing is of course it's like before we even started talking and and it is territorial and I and I mean that both in the positive and negative sense of the word that it's it's you stand up and okay this my um, I own from this twig to like to this you know five meter radius or whatever it's mine you know mm -hmm. so it is a very sort of, it sounds very, very out there, but it, it is actually a very sort of natural thing, you know, and of course, like rappers and, you know, everybody in music is sort of doing that or opera, you, you could talk about the first opera houses in Italy that were actually tiny. And, and uh, when I walked into it, I understood, yeah, yes, like how you can claim a, the whole space and you could look every person into the eye while you were singing. And I actually found it very interesting, again, <laughs> when I'd been away for two, three years, that I think what I do spatially, I hope this doesn't sound too like abstract, or I actually try to soak all the stuff that's in five meter radius around me and sort of, I, I kind of absorb it. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and I get, I'm like exhausted. And I'm like, don't stop absorbing those buildings inside you. Stop it. Just let, <laughs> I'm like, stop it, you know. So I think, um, I think 
it's not right or wrong. Robin, I'm not saying one thing is right, and I'm not trying to be like a spatial rural fascist or something like <laughs> like people have to be like me or they're wrong. Not at all, because I have a I have a lot of musicians who were brought up in cities and make techno beats, and that's absolutely their um, way of being territorial and sharing the concrete <laughs> they are inside. But um, yeah, I yeah, sorry. It's, does that make sense? It does. You're kind. You, my, I feel like my head is exploding with this idea. <laughs> this is so interesting um, to claim. Well, not necessarily to claim space, but to 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 fill space around you with with music, and and that it, it strikes me as so resonant with how other animals use their sounds um, in, in just that way. Why would we be different? Um, oh, I love this. Um, so interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that insight. Um, this is going to um, come with me when I'm walking in the woods now. <laughs> and thinking about that, the territoriality of song. Um, very cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for a beautiful question. And, uh, I hope the uh, reply wasn't too pretentious, but uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but it is actually really, really natural. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. It was so wonderful to talk to you. You too. I was, I'm a, so little, I was a little nervous. <laughs> Me too. I, Me too. I, After all, I'm talking to Bjork. <laughs> I'm not usually the one who asks the questions, so I was a little a little nervous, but I uh, hope I wasn't too too uh, stressed out or something. But um, thanks for a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful conversation. I, I can't wait. I'm going to lull over all your answers. Well, thank you for the, the opportunity to, to visit, and I hope our paths will cross one day as we're walking through the woods. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do a Papa Wee song, duet. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to Artists on Writers, Writers on Artists. To catch the video version of this and other episodes, or to subscribe to our newsletter so you can be alerted to future episodes, please visit artform.com or bookforum.com. 